everyone. Whoa, it's a bit loud. Hello, everyone. My name is Paolo, and uh, I will be talking about uh, the things I've learned about making the fastest JavaScript server runtime in the world. So, before we start, I can do like a hands up. Who here doesn't like to have fast applications? Oh, you don't like? Oh. I was expecting no hands, but there are hands. <laughs> so before, before I get into the topic, I, uh, I want to make a small introduction. So if you choose your favorite uh, search engine, and I'm using this one just because, um, if you look like, look, try to search for the question, is JavaScript fast, you will get lots of answers. And uh, one of the top answers that you'll find, if you just read the, 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 the gist, will say something like, under the right circumstances, JavaScript is very, very fast, actually as fast as C. That's a, quite a good statement. So I kept on looking, and the, like the second result was like, why is JavaScript fast? And it was on a, on a blog, and uh, if you read the gist, it will be something like, as soon as you understand the event loop and how it processes requests, you realize why is it so fast? So, okay, um, but still I don't have like the answer to my question. So I kept looking, third result, how can it be so fast if it's single threaded? And uh, the stack overflow answer is because it's lightweight. That's interesting, but still I don't really get the uh, the point. So I kept looking and then I looked and uh, the second uh, uh, question from Stack Overflow was like, how fast is it compared to Java? And the answer was like, JavaScript is awesome and hot and shines when it comes to a huge amount of short connections. Okay, we're getting somewhere. That's interesting. So and ju just to finish, because otherwise I'll be here showing you all the results from, from a search engine. Uh, then you get something like, but what makes it faster than Java? And the answer that you get from Strongloop is, well, because the sync ecosystem is more than 50,000 modules written in a synchronous style. So my question is like, given all the questions, uh, the, 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 given all these answers to the question I made, how do we trust the internet? Can we trust the internet? So if you follow like Game of Thrones recently, like in the, one of the last shows, someone said something like, uh, not, not exactly like this, but someone said something like, the internet is full of stories and stories connect people. We all love stories. However, stories are not an exact science. So uh, uh, what, uh, what we should be, what should drive us is being the internet, uh, being an engineer. So if you quest to, if you question, do we trust the internet? Well, personally, I don't. Well, and I don't because of this great lady. I don't know if you know her, but uh, if you don't, it's a Mar Margaret Hamilton. And uh, among other things, she wrote the software that uh, allowed the first people to walk on the moon and land safely. And she did it with only two kilobytes of RAM. Like nowadays, who uses two kilobytes of RAM? And, no one. And another interesting thing that she uh, coined was the term software engineer. So we should all thank her for, for, for being such a great woman. So when you talk about the engineering, and if you look on the dictionary, you see that engineering is the application of science and mathematics by which the properties of matter and the sources of energy in nature are made useful to people. So as an engineer, we should apply science and mathematics to the way we solve our problems. So if you go again to the initial question, is JavaScript fast? I think the right answer is, I don't know, because all the answers didn't really add up. So before we start like now investigating like the 10 things that I made in the, in the title, how to make a, a fast uh, server, so let's first define our problem. Um, so when I was writing the, the abstract for this talk, I decided to, to write the title, 10 things I learned making the fastest JavaScript server runtime in the world. So, and I carefully decided to choose the word server. Why? 
because again, going back to Wikipedia, not a dictionary in this case, uh, Wikipedia says that a server is a computer in a network that is used to provide services such as access to files or shared peripherals or the routing of email to other computers in the network. So what I'm going to talk about here is about servers. I'm not talking about common line applications. I'm not talking about serverless functions. I'm talking about servers. So the second thing we need to define is fast. What does it mean fast? I can put, for example, uh, a Raspberry Pi on a Formula One car and send it on a racetrack and it's really, really fast because it goes really fast. But that's not what we're talking about. When I'm talking about fast, we need to define a common set of metrics. And the metrics I chose to define fast uh, come from the monitoring server applications. So if you are interested in the topic, I strongly suggest you to look into SRE. So SRE stands for Site Reliability Engineering. And um, basically, it's the discipline that incorporates aspects of software engineering and applies them to infrastructure and operation problems. The main goals are to create ultra-scalable and high-reliable software systems. Google has one of the biggest SRE teams in the world, and they just screwed up last week. And they wrote lots of uh, interesting books that you can read all about. And on their books and on their blogs, you can, they, they identified five golden signals. So a golden signal are uh, critical, are critical uh, signals for ops teams to monitor their, their systems and identify problems. So these signals are especially important when you are moved to microservices or containers. So this, the, the signals are basically, uh, allows you to basically, um, have metrics to monitor uh, your system. Um, gathering, gathering information about these, these signals is quite challenging and depends on the, the framework you're using, the, the, the environment you're running, and you need to have special tooling for it. So for this, I'm not considering the, the full five, I'm only considering rate, as in uh, rate requests per second error like in error rate, like errors per second. And finally, latency, like in response time, including queuing, waiting time. Just focusing on these three uh, uh, signals, uh, rate, errors, and latency, means that I will focus on the software that I'm building, and I'm not focusing on my operating system or the hardware. So. Now that we have the concept of server and fast and what, we, uh, what fast is, we need to define what, what's the environment where our application will run the life cycle. So a typical server application has a well set of characteristics. Uh, we need to define now what a server application is. So a server application is first a long running process. That's why I, I was said before that when I say server, I'm not considering common line applications or, or serverless functions. Second, it's deployed on a cloud or in bare metal, doesn't really matter. It should be attached to a fast network, otherwise uh, you might have the fastest application ever, but if your network is the bottleneck, then nothing will come out of it. And finally, you should have enough CPU or memory to run your application, because, well, you all know why. So now that you have these definitions, we need to, to measure. So if you go on the internet, there's lots of internet articles that tell you how fast something is, but most of the times they will just present you some fancy graphs, but they will not tell you how they managed to achieve those results. Sorry. Doorbell. Jesus. Sorry. <laughs> Someone is at my home. <laughs> Sorry for interruption. Um, so no one will tell you how they managed to achieve the information to build those fancy graphs. And as an uh, engineer, this, this is incorrect. As an engineer, you should be able to produce the results and also let everyone know how did you manage to achieve those results. And this, this, this protocol can be then later uh, verified uh, in, a, in a lab environment and other people can achieve exactly the same results. It, 
should also be that uh, the, the, the experiment, experiment should be peer reviewed so other people can confirm because they can re reproduce your, your tests that your results are correct and they're not biased. So it means that uh, you are not optimizing the, the, the application for your own benefit. So everything is fair to everyone. And most important, like writing a benchmark is really, really hard. First, first thing about benchmarks is that a benchmark will never, ever, ever represent a real world use case. You only look at the tiny subset of your use case and you test it. So every time you look at the benchmark, you always need to take it with a pinch of salt because you never, with a grain of salt, not a pinch, uh, otherwise you have like heart disease, with a grain of salt. And uh, you need to, to yeah, consider like, well, my application doesn't do that, it does way more, but it just get an idea. And then getting people to look and peer review your your, your benchmark and also to compete against your benchmark, it's even harder because who wants to compete and, and then they realize that they will be slower or worse. No one likes to lose, right? Because we're all humans. We all like to, to win. So, because benchmarking is hard, um, making a meaningful benchmark is even harder. So I, I gave up on trying to define my own benchmark and I found a, a, ben a very popular benchmark on the internet called the Tech Empower Frameworks Benchmark. So this benchmark has more than 500 contributors. It has uh, merged more than 3,000 uh, pull requests and has more than 10,000 uh, commits. And these, are, these numbers are like from two weeks ago, more or less. And the, the benchmark, you can find it on this web, on this uh, GitHub repo, already tests for 630 different frameworks in many different languages. So I'm not just talking about uh, language A versus language B, but like a wide spectrum of languages. And this makes my life way easier because I don't need to prove to anyone that uh, what I'm trying to measure is, is correct because as soon as I try to commit something on this benchmark, all these committers and everyone else will like, like hawks on top of me looking, are you following the rules? Are you trying to cheat? Okay, no, you're not. So we will gladly accept your, your contribution. So before doing anything, I just look at the benchmark. And the, as I said, it's like 630 different frameworks. So it's really hard to put it on one slide and it, everything gets really small so don't really bother if you cannot see but what I want you to the, the image that I want to get you here is that if you look at the graph and you need to twist your head and you try to look for the first JavaScript framework on this list where do you think it's gonna be is it gonna be on the top who thinks it's gonna be on the top let me help you it's here <laughs> And this means that the first best uh, JavaScript framework ranks at number 89, which basically it's saying that it performs at 22.7% uh, compared to the, the best one. It's like the best one is 100%, that this one is 22.7. And I thought, well, from what I've read on the internet, how can this be? Like every, JavaScript is fast because of the event loop, because of the synchronous ecosystem. So what you need to do next is we need to look under the hood, like what's going on. Before doing any kind of optimization, we need first to understand what's going on. So we need to, we cannot jump into conclusions, start tweaking the code, because if you start tweaking the code, like Venkat said in the morning, we just yak shaving. We, we just change a line here and there, and maybe we'll get one position up or two. But it, it doesn't really solve the problem. We're just trying to, 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 to experiment. And as I said, I like to be engineer, so we need to take a scientific approach. So we need to kind of uh, debug the application and profile it. And if you want to learn how to profile JavaScript applications, there's a very good uh, article on the Node.js uh, uh, tutorial on the profiling section of, of the documentation. And I recommend you guys to, to read it. So if you look at one of the tests, which is the simplest one, because, and it's also the best to illustrate the problem, um, the, the simplest test, which is like mostly meaningless, 
is something like this. Uh, serve a string like hello world uh, as fast as you can. So when you look at the code, and I just kind of reduced the, the original code that, that, that was implemented for, for the winning benchmark, you see something like this. Uh, I will fork my, my process as many CPUs I have, so I can use all the cores, because as you know, Node.js is just a single core, single process on a single core. And then for there, I have an uh, Express server, which probably wasn't like the smartest idea because Express is not, uh, well, it, 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 it brings you a bit of complexity that you probably could just do with a HTTP server. But anyway, when there's a request to the URL slash plain text, you just send the, the, that message back. So if we start profiling the application, and if you follow the, the article I just mentioned from the Node.js documentation, they have a section on flame graphs. So you do a flame graph, and again, don't worry that you cannot see the details. What is important here is that if you look at the code, you start reading like where is your CPU time being spent? And you see like from the bottom stuff like, let me try to get more. If, if I get this right, you start seeing stuff like you spend time on Node, UV, UV streams, uh, Node V8, 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 Node, 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 and you barely see any JavaScript reference in flame graph. So if I put this into a different kind of a perspective, what you are observing is that uh, very tiny, small bars that you almost don't see are JavaScript. That's like in, in the top, your application. And everything that your CPU is spending time is node bindings, V8, async IO, event loop. And because it's native code, because it's, it's a C library, there's no way to uh, optimize it in, at, at runtime. The only thing you can optimize, or the V8 cheat compiler can optimize, is your script code. So. What happens is that when you try to optimize your JavaScript code, you only have to optimize the tip of the iceberg. So this made me think, hmm, that's strange. That's interesting. What can we do about this? So I start a quest on looking at other JavaScript uh, runtimes. Because if we think of JavaScript, everyone will think of V8. V8 is a JavaScript engine. It speeds up the real world performance for more than JavaScript and enables developers to build a faster future web. This is like the mission statement of V8. But there are other engines out there. So if you look at uh, the Kangax table that shows the compat compatibility of ES6 engines out there, and by the way, Kangax is not an authority on JavaScript engines, they already list several other alternatives. This, they list like ChakraCore, uh, SpiderMonkey from Firefox, Script4 from uh, uh, Safari, and they have a new one called GraalJS. So this GraalJS is, is, comes from a new project from Oracle, it's open source. And uh, looking at these engines, I decided to try other engines. And after doing a couple of experiments, I decided to look into Graal. So Graal is this new open source project by, by Oracle, uh, where they are totally uh, modifying the way the, 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 the Java virtual machine works to be polyglot. So you can write your application in Java, Scala, Groovy, JavaScript, Ruby, R, Python, C, C++, Rust. And in, in the end, uh, when you pass your code to this modified uh, uh, VM, uh, all code will run at the top performance that you'd get from, from a, a Java application. Uh, the objective of Graal is to improve the performance of the Java virtual machine based on uh, base languages to match the performance of native languages. So another goal is to allow free-form mixing of code from any programming language in a single program, which is also interesting. You can now start mixing all the languages and there's no performance penalty. And on top of that, they offer a modern JavaScript runtime that uh, implements the ES2019 and ES2020 uh, uh, specifications. So my goal is to like to have a really fast server, but I'm not going to switch to other languages. So I'm just going to focus on GraalJS. So from their definition, they have a JavaScript, th their goals, the mission goals of the project is to provide JavaScript with the best perf possible performance 
fully compatible with the latest specifications and fast interoperability. So there are lots of academic research done on this area because the project is just open source for a year or so, but they are working on it for like eight years already, but they weren't really open because they were like researching in, uh, in uh, academia. But uh, if you go there, you, you realize that there are results showing that GraalJS can be faster or on pair with V8, uh, just when talking about uh, JavaScript. So I thought, okay, that's, that's a good, interesting thing to experiment. So I decided to create an hypothesis. Let's formulate like a project, uh, which I will call e ECMAScript, ECMAScript for X. And this project will do a couple of things that no one kind of would expect it to do. Like first, I will replace V8 with GraalJS. Second, I will replace the libuv with Eclipse Vertex. So all the IO will done with a different library. Second, I will, since there is no V8, I can, the, the V8 JIT compiler is not there, so it's replaced with the, compiler from, from GraalVM. Fourth, and this is quite interesting, I don't have node bindings. I only have type definitions of Java API, APIs that I need because uh, type definitions are not used at runtime. So the fastest code you can write is code that doesn't run. So if you just use type definitions to get access to the, to the uh, under, underpinning of your, your system, then you get more performance. And finally, it implements a common JS and a ESM loader, and has some basic uh, NPM compatibility, so there are no node native modules. And finally, you can debug a profile using Chrome DevTools, because otherwise you have uh, something that is not really useful. So, once I've, I've done this, I decided to implement the framework, the, the previous test, in, in this new framework. So the big difference here is that first I'm just using ES6 and the ESM modules. Second one is that I don't need to fork because um, Eclipse Vertex will handle all the cores for, for us. So I don't need to fork. So all the CPU will be using is full capacity. And the IO library that uh, a Vertex is used is called Netty. And probably no one here has heard about Netty, but Netty is a very popular library and it's used by Google, Twitter, Netflix, and is currently maintained by Apple because they wanted to have a very uh, fast services. So these guys working on it really know their, their stuff. So once to, you install this uh, small utility, because again, we're not gonna run Node, so this is just like a script that runs the, the, the code in a different environment, you are ready to go. So I, have I, I pre-recorded a small example. So if I create a project, so basically if you look here, it's just a typical uh, JavaScript application. I define a couple of dependencies. You shouldn't do this. You should use like pr proper versioning, but for demos it's, it's acceptable. And then I create a, a new file called routes just to show like the VS6 uh, capabilities of importing and exporting modules. And I define a function home that will just reply uh, a string like hello from vertex where plus yes 4 x And then I create a main entry point to the in index MGS. Well, I import a router, pretty much the same concepts as uh, Express. I import uh, the home function that I just defined in the previous uh, module. Uh, and now I just create my application. So constant app is my router. Think of router as the Express uh, function. And now I just do, I route the home to be my function. I know I create uh, the HTTP server. I say to my HTTP server that my request handler should be the, the app I created and I say listen on specific port. 
and yeah, I can do some print console log like application ready listening on port 8080. So the interesting part here is that uh, I can now use uh, Yarn to get my packages or NPM, doesn't really matter. Then I can create like some tooling on VS Code to have like uh, debug support. So my application just started and you can uh, do stuff like breakpoints. So if you make a request and you look in this area, you see like here, the interesting part is that you can, yeah, you could see on the debugger both code coming from your script and both code coming from Java because of GraalVM, you can have everything mixed together at the same performance. So the expectation when I did this is that um, when you write code in this kind of uh, way, your, your user code, your JavaScript, your runtime, plus the interrupt with all the Java code if needed, plus the GraalJS engine, plus my IO library, plus the JDK, because it, GraalVM is still on top of JDK, everything will be optimized by Graal, not just the script itself. Instead of just optimizing the tip of the iceberg, my, the, the Graal will do all the optimization. So I decided to test my experiment. And I was like amazed, like, like Katie Bauman was, but okay, my stuff is totally not important. She really found something really big. So after I got like a drum roll, trrr, so look at who's the top 10 on the tests, because I managed to submit the, the framework to, to Tech Empower and after being peer reviewed, it got accepted and merged. And now the CI shows us, and will this work, that we are the first JavaScript framework on the list, instead of being number 89, is number five. So, and in another test, which is a bit more complex, is just running about uh, 20, 20 database queries in parallel per request. Uh, this new JavaScript framework can run, okay, uh, ranks at number six. So like I just show you how you put JavaScript on the top 10 of the fastest frameworks in the world. So how does it compare with how it was before? The cool thing about this, this project is that you can do all the visualizations and comparisons for you. So in one test that they were just doing some JSON serialization, you see something like this. Uh, the previous best was Node.js using Chakra, because Chakra is some kind of improvement. So I'll just give you numbers. Like before, uh, the Node.js with Chakra could handle 558,261 requests per second. And now it does 1.146774. 1, 1, okay, but well, JSON serialization is a very trivial test, doesn't really mean anything. So let's do some database stuff. And when you do database stuff, then you see like how the optimization of the IO and the whole world uh, turns out to be. Before, the best result was 195,638. And with uh, the, this framework, uh, is now 677,568. But to be fair, to be fair, uh, I'm using Postgres, and the previous West was doing MongoDB. So to be fair, the first Postgres on the list was doing 110, 964 requests per second, and now we're doing 677,000. So this means we just went like a sixth full improvement. And you can go with this kind of looking at um, uh, multiple database queries, where when you start doing lots of pressure on your application, you went from 7,000 to 42,000, so it's about 5.5 times the, the improvement. And this is m even more complicated, because now you start seeing concurrency, right? doing uh, lots of uh, the database updates and, and reads. So before we have like uh, uh, 4,000 requests and now we have 21, so it's see like a um, huge, huge thing. So the, the final thing that I just want to, to, to talk about is like, um, how do you do all this? So because I'm talking about uh, optimization and uh, I'm sorry, I really need to 
optimization is like a never-ending job. Uh, no matter what you do, there's always something that you can do after to improve it and better and better and better. One, one thing that you can do is that um, Oracle being Oracle has two versions of the, of, the, of the project. There's the open source one, which is what I'm showing, and there's like a paid one, which will give you 20% extra boost, but you cannot show it on benchmarks. So if you use that one, you get the even better results, so it doesn't matter. So after this, you can just uh, try to think of other tricks and you just rinse and repeat, and it's like a never-ending job. So like last week, when I was preparing to, to come here, I decided to make like a tweet as a joke, like uh, I'm gonna talk about fast JavaScript, so what do you want me to uh, show you? So I made like a pool. Do you want to see um, how to use popular NPMs or to how to debug and profile your, your, your code? So the, the choice was like how to debug and profile. Uh, that's unfortunate because I was hoping to show you like how to use the uh, standard uh, uh, GraphQL f library from Facebook on this, and it just works, and it does. So, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to show you how to debug and profile. So to do that, I need to switch to Visual Studio Code, and I'm going to put it here. Yes, and it's try to improve it a bit. So I've created a very simple application, which. Uh, oh. which I will try to, I don't know, to, oh, no. So I create a very simple application with a couple of routes uh, for serving an open page, for serving the API requests and showing a, a thing or two about errors. And so I have uh, the application running and if I would say, okay, I go here on my terminal and I do HTTP localhost API, uh, not HTTL, of course, HTTP. HTTP. I'm using HTTP PI. Uh, oh, I already have an await, oh, okay. Uh, I'll remove that in the breakpoint. So as you can see, I can uh, already like the, the Chrome Devs tool working. So I make an API request and the what I wanted to show you, like pi is not really 2.17, but it should be three point something. So uh, if I would say, okay, let's debug this stuff. So you need to go here and put in a breakpoint. And if you make a new request, now the debugger is there, so we can inspect like what the context is. And uh, uh, the interesting part is that because the GraalJS is an uh, advanced engine, you already have like all the await, async await features, uh, you have promises, we have ESM modules, you don't need to use any uh, code transformation, it just works out of the box. So, and to show how it works, so I have this, and uh, I say, okay, let, let it go. And it's like, oh, it didn't stop on the next line. But, uh, of course not, because it's in a synchronous uh, uh, request. So the second time, the, the the result comes in. Now I can inspect what the value of pi. So if I skip, I can put mouse here and see, oh, pi is 2.7, which is kind of strange. So you just let it go. Well, should be true, right? So you can now just go here and say, step in. And then here, I have here the, some, some formula to calculate pi. And if you read the, the documentation, it says like you do like this, uh, uh, resolve this series and you have the value of pi. And what is important to notice is that la 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 five times you could see, oh, I went too fast. What I wanted to see is that on the formula it should be four times the value, not three times. So if you do three times, it will solve your, your issue. And then, but this is like trivial stuff that you guys should already know, right? No, no, nothing really complicated. So um, the second thing I can do is that I just go here and I say, hey, my microphone is falling. Um, okay. 
I go here and I do something like um, whoop, 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 whoop. yarn start. So I start my application. This is just the, 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 the yarn package manager. So my application is running. And now I could do something like uh, in, on a new window. I can do something like uh, scripts. And I have a key here. Um, I do like a load generator. So I'm like uh, doing a, a load test on my, my, my server, just making a request to, to, to the API. And now, of course, I disable the debugger, otherwise this would take forever. And if you like, OK, uh, it's uh, doing 43,000 uh, requests per second. But now if I would go, uh, oh, generator. Let's say, let's say that I want to go to the home page. And I just uh, I need to rerun my test. I'll run it for 10 seconds. Then you wait 10 seconds. And you see like only 770 requests per second. So the thing is now, it's not probably a debugging issue. It's a profiling issue. The thing I want to show is that even though uh, right now I'm just using the typical JavaScript uh, tools, uh, we can also use, let me pick the window from this side, all the monitoring, oh, this is really handy because uh, the, uh, uh, is it eight? Like, how do you? Uh, okay. You can even use the tools from from the JVM, and the JVM has been optimized for the last twenty five years to run. So, so they have pretty good tools to to inspect what's going on. So, I see here's my application. I can just say connect to it. And I can even say, like, OK, monitor what's going on. And pretty much like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Node.js, there's an, uh, the, the event loop. But uh, my, my laptop is not that advanced, so I'm just using two event loops. So I probably need to zoom out. So if I would know, I go here again, and I would load my test and switch. You now start look, seeing these purple bars this purple bars on my my event loop, and if you look at the purple bars, it says that I, my thread is slipping. So then I know, okay, the, uh, there's something that I need to investigate in my uh, in my code. So you go to the uh, home home API, and you see that oh, I did some bad thing. I put my code to sleep all the time. Every time a request comes in, so you need to get rid of it. And as you can see here, I can now start mixing code from Java in JavaScript. Uh, so you can, someone was saying the other day that uh, NPM is awesome because the amount of packages they have, they have more pages, packages than anyone else. Now with the Growl VM and Growl GS, you can use all the packages from NPM. You can all use all the packages from Maven. And you can use even, if, if, if you want to, you can even use all the packages from, from Python. You can now start mixing everything. It's 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 crazy. So, and then things that uh, uh, I I could start showing you like uh, okay, let's do some some more uh, uh, interesting stuff. Like I have this uh, um, API, and uh, I have here another test script, which is uh, run ping. So run ping is just uh, every second or so making a request to the, the PID route, and the PID route is just doing a, a console, a, a, a returning like the, um, my uh, process ID. So the pro and I want to show you here that, OK, it's just always the same value. It never changes. So, but if your application needs to scale, because I'm using like this uh, incredible, incredibly cool Vertex call, uh, tool called Vertex, I can say stuff like, uh, let me cluster my application. 
So out of the box, without doing anything, I can now have like a clustered uh, um, script store services. I am now in the background starting lots of services. So instead of um, if everything goes according to plan, of course not because it's demo time. Oh, it is. You start seeing like different process IDs, like your application just became a distributed system because now uh, you're using other libraries that could do all this stuff for you. And it doesn't need to be all running on the same machine. I could have like one node running on my laptop, another one Azure, another one on Amazon, and they would all distribute all the code for you and run your application in, in a distributed system, which is quite interesting because it's the, old, the ultimate goal of every software developer. Like if I would now come here with a hammer and smash my laptop, the application would still running into other places. It's like the ultimate, the, the dream of the internet, right? I'm not going to uh, bother you guys uh, much more, so I'm um, going back to, to my slides. So let me go into conclusions. The, the, the main thing I want you guys to take out from this talk is that there's nothing wrong with JavaScript because I was quite annoyed when I started reading people saying, yeah, we left, uh, we were using this JavaScript application and it performed so bad, so we just decided to rewrite it everything in Rust or in Go because, you know, Go and Rust is fast. And I'm like, I'm again like in the beginning of this talk, what do you mean? Yeah, you know, it's fast because it's native. Sure. So. <laughs> Yes, JavaScript can be fast. You just need to know where to look to and do not uh, uh, assume that because you're using one tool that everyone just blogs about and thinks it's fast. Uh, that, that, that's correct. So please, before switching to Go, Rust, whatever, I have nothing against those languages. I do love them. But just look what, what you can do with, with your JavaScript runtimes. And most important, dare to experiment. Because this was what drove me to, to do what I did. I, I decided, okay, I will experiment something. Probably I will fail, uh, but it doesn't matter. That's how you make science, how you do engineering. So thank you. If you want to follow me on Twitter, that's my Twitter account with a zero, because apparently there's a, a, a big football player with the same name as I do. So it's really hard to get a cool handle these days. On GitHub, the footballer doesn't know how to code, so <laughs> I win. And there's the link for the project. It's open source. You can look at the code. You can make pull requests. You can co comment on my bad coding skills. And uh, if there are any questions, please. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, anyone? Oh, there's one person in the front. The question was, are there known limitations when using third-party yeah. projects? So you, don't have, uh, you don't have node bindings. No. So if you use a third-party library that uses um, node packages... Then this will not work out of the box. Okay. The, be, uh, the Graal VM, the, the guys wanted to show off uh, the, the capabilities. So what they did, they also shipped with a, a binary called Node, where the, the thing they did, they removed V8, they plugged in Graal.js, and then the, uh, you still have the, the libuv and all the rest, so you can use the Node native packages there. But again, because libuv and all the libraries that come with it, are native, you, they will not uh, get all the performance improvements, so we will not get these results. You can use, you can start thinking of doing tricks. You can use uh, the concept of workers, and you can, if you have code that really requires those features, you spawn a worker that will run on the real node with uh, with Graal.js, so we have all the features, and then for the uh, high performance I/O and scaling, you can use this. Uh, do you have any application in production using your your engine? 
Yes. No, because as I said, it's, it was an experiment. Yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> the but only application I have is the benchmark itself, which is uh, hosted. On <laughs> but but I know, I know keep, that... You uh, want to keep the experiment going, try to yes. make something bigger? Yes, I'm keeping the project going on because this year uh, there's uh, again the Google Summer of Code and they have, I have one student which I'm mentoring which is implementing full TypeScript support for it. So uh, when you use any kind of library, uh, you can just code in TypeScript directly. So you get like full code completion and type safety and, and so on. And I know that there were some experiments uh, happening in a big uh, corporate uh, with a blue logo and three letters, starts with I and M, I'm not saying <laughs> which one, that implemented the GraphQL support using the official Facebook GraphQL JavaScript implementation on top of this. Okay. Uh, by the way, is this going to be maintained by Red Hat? Any connection there? Or? The, 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 my connection, I work for Red Hat, but I am a developer for the Eclipse Vertex project, and this is a sub project from Eclipse Vertex. So it's under the Eclipse Foundation. It will always remain open source. And uh, well, we'll see it from there. Uh, how did you choose that name? Uh, it's a very good question. Like, most important thing uh, to know is that JavaScript is a registered trademark by Oracle, which is a big corporation, and I'm, I'm just a person. I cannot afford a, a very expensive lawyer. So I just decided to avoid the JS part <laughs> and go with uh, the spec name, which is ECMAScript. ECMAScript. And then, uh, yeah, just playing with words, words, ECMAScript for vertex, for X, for something. <laughs> Thanks. No, I think we're done. Thank you very much.